How often have you found yourself in a really bad situation and there doesn't seem to be any way out? Whatever you do seems to take you up against a brick wall or it just causes more pain and more difficulty. The situation gets worse. And there just doesn't seem to be any form of escape route. Well, at some point, I'm sure we've all been there, and if you're blessed to have never been there, at some point that day will arrive. The difficulty may be caused by a bad family environment, starting early on in childhood, or it could be bullying in school, or it may be that you end up with a terrible job that seeks to trap its employees so that they can't move on. Or it may be the other end of the spectrum, you're unemployed and you can't find a job. It may be that you're trapped in poor, inadequate housing that you can't afford to move on from. These are the difficulties that our people face today. And then we've got the cost of living crisis as well, where so many people now are struggling to make ends meet and they're having to skip meals in order to feed their children or decide to put the heating on. These are the difficulties that so many people have in life. Well, there's other people who seem to, effort, seem to just sidestep these issues and they seem to be absolutely fine. But eventually, everyone ends up in a situation where there seems to be no one way forward. It catches up with us all. It may be through poor health. It may be about just growing older and having to slow down and uh, maybe have treatment to just slow the inevitable decline that comes upon everyone. Or there's the sorrows of old age and bereavement and loss. At some point, each one of us will find ourselves facing despair. And when we find ourselves in that place, how do we cope? How do we respond? Feeling hopeless, or feeling helpless and powerless is a terrible situation to be in. Some people just can't cope with that because they like to be in control of everything. But there's some times where you are in a place and you have no control over what is happening. And in that situation, some people may just put on a brave face and try to keep on living the life that makes them happy. While other people, they may just surrender to the despair, they may just embrace it, often becoming bitter and eager to share the knowledge of the hardship that they're facing with others. Usually starting off by saying, I don't often talk about this, but this is what I'm facing. And that seems to dominate every conversation. But for the Christian, we find ourselves in a different place. We know that these trials come upon us because we live in a world that is full of sin and is broken. A world that we are just passing through. A world where everything is under the control of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Which means everything that happens to us must somehow work out for our good. A world where Christ is able to rescue people from every difficulty or give them the strength that they need to endure. And here in Luke's Gospel, we see Jesus' public ministry going up a gear as he reaches out and helps two people who knew nothing but despair. And he changed their situation around so that their lives were filled with hope and potential once again. So please turn to Luke 5 verse 12 and let's see how Jesus reached out and help these people, starting with the leper. And I just want us to think for a moment about his situation. So to help us with that, we're going to give him a name. We're going to call him um, Jude. That was a name that was used at, at that time. And I don't think there's anyone here called Jude this morning, is that so? It's always dangerous giving names to Bible characters because it turns out that there's someone called that name in the congregation. Well, let's think about this leper called Jude. And for Jude, it had all started out with a bit of an itch on his hand, a small rash that was just a minor irritant. And at first he thought, oh, maybe I've been bitten by an insect or brushed against the wrong plant, and surely it'll clear up in a day or so. But it didn't. The rash sunk in, and it didn't go away. And instead of disappearing, it started to spread. 
And some days there was hope. Because whenever someone has a rash or eczema or something like that, there are some days when it seems to nearly disappear. But then it bursts out again, bigger, nastier, slowly gaining ground. And it moves from an itch to being a pain. And then, even worse, the bits that were most affected, they went numb. There was no sensation there at all. And for a while, Jude was trying to kill himself that everything was okay, that he would recover. But soon he could not hide his condition. He had to be taken to a priest, examined, and they examined him several times over several weeks. And when there was no improvement, Jude's condition was declared a defiling disease, and he was officially registered as unclean unclean until he was healed. And that meant that he had to live away from other people. Whenever anyone got close to him, he had to shout out, unclean, keep your distance, I'm dangerous, you catch something from me. Jude lost everything. His family could no longer spend time with him, though they always made sure he was provided for and had food. His children couldn't give their father a hug anymore. His wife was effectively a widow. His family could have nothing to do with him. He couldn't work anymore. He lost everything. All he could do was live away from people alongside others who shared his condition, other lepers. And even worse than this, he could no longer go to the temple to worship God. He was alone and powerless to do anything about it. In ancient Israel, many different skin conditions were called leprosy. Today we know leprosy as Hansen's disease, and that's a truly terrible condition, which did occur back then. Um, it's a condition which is treatable today, but some people still do go uh, down with it. Um, back then, there were loads of different skin conditions which were classed as leprosy. Some of them are conditions which are quite minor today, maybe conditions that some of us have had, like psoriasis, something like that. If you had that in ancient Israel, you uh, were declared a leper, unclean, and you had to stay away from others. And according to Leviticus 10, verses 10 and 11, this was all, um, it was the duty of the priest to distinguish well, who was unclean and who was clean. And this declaration of whether someone was clean or unclean is all to do with the priest distinguishing between what was holy and what was common. You see, God is the supreme holy being and anyone who wishes to come into his presence must be classed as holy too. Being unclean is a bar to holiness, and anyone who comes into contact with the holy in an unclean state will die. All kinds of things used to make people unclean. We tend to think it'd be a terrible stigma, don't we? But actually, just the ordinary course of life would make someone unclean. So if you ate the wrong food, you were unclean. So having a bacon butty for breakfast was definitely out. Having contact with dead animals, um, having contact with human corpses, that really made you unclean. All kinds of bodily discharges, um, including having sex, made people unclean for a day or so. And then certain diseases, including the skin conditions. In most cases, when a person became unclean, they would be unclean for maybe a day, they'd have a wash, and they'd be classed as clean once again, and able to go into the temple. But with certain medical conditions, the person remained unclean until they were healed. And our friend Jude has just been declared unclean and he will remain in that state, ostracised from his family and isolated from the temple, unable to worship God with the people until he is healed. And you've got to admit, that's a rough situation to be in. Um, and for him, during normal times, that would be the rest of his life, separated from his family, from society and from the temple, while his condition slowly consumed him. But fortunately for Jude, he's in the right place at the right time and help is at hand. Help is there because the Lord Jesus Christ is in the area. And what's so impressive about leper Jude is the incredible faith that he has. 
This disease cannot be touched by the medicine at the time, but this man knows that Jesus can heal him. The question is, is Jesus willing to heal him? As he falls at Jesus' feet, you can sense the desperation that he has, and he's thinking, will this man have mercy upon me? And Jesus does. He is willing to heal. He reaches out and touches this man, maybe the first human touch he has felt for years, and through that touch, he is cleansed, healed, restored, back to full health. Then even though Jesus has come to earth to fulfill the law, this is a time before the cross, and that, and that means that Jude is sent off to the priest for examination. Jesus always kept the law. He always kept it. And when someone was, uh, when the condition, skin condition cleaned up, they went to the priest. The priest examined them again in the same way that he'd been examined beforehand. And after that period, he was declared clean, able to go back to his family, rejoin society, and go and worship God again in the temple. So Jesus has done this for this man. And he said to him, just keep it quiet. You know, don't tell people about it. But how can you keep something like this quiet? First of all, the priest would go, oh, I remember you. What's happened then? How come you're like this? So he's got to tell him about Jesus and his family. He's going to tell his family and his family are going to tell other people, which means that the news is going to spread. And as the news spread, there's a danger that it's going to take the focus off the other aspect of Jesus's um, mission at this point which is sharing that essential message of how people need to repent and believe that the kingdom of God is near. Because that's what Jesus was doing. He was preaching first. He was telling people to get right with God first. The preaching came first because being right spiritually is more important than being right physically. But he was demonstrating that the kingdom of God was near by healing people, by setting people free from demonic possession and uh, in cases like where he quietens the storm, he's telling his disciples who he is. So the preaching is the important thing. But people, they tend to focus more on the diseases being healed. So Jesus is saying, keep it quiet, but news was still spreading. Well, when we think about this uh, leper situation, now there's something about that being isolated and separated from society, which resonates with us now in a way that it didn't three years ago. We've gone through this terrible COVID pandemic and we've heard the terrible stories, maybe even experienced things ourselves about how someone with a disease is suddenly surrounded by strangers in protective clothing. That's gonna give someone confidence, isn't it? When everyone around them is surrounded in several layers of PPE. And how many of these people had to die alone and away from their families. How children were unable to visit their elderly relatives in care homes to say goodbye. We understand the horror of isolation today more than we did three years ago. But we have to also recognise that the biggest problem that our friend Jude, the leper who was cleansed had, he was unclean, unable to enter the temple to worship God, and then he was made clean. Symbolically, he was distant from God. And now he is able to enter God's presence again in the temple today. And in our society today, the people around us, even though we can now meet up again, we don't have to wear face masks, we can go to the cinema and the theatre, we can go in shops without any problems. People are still spiritually a thousand miles away from God, even further. They are still unclean, able, unable to enter God's presence. And they're like that because of their rebellious attitudes. They're not grateful to God for giving them life. The only reason they're breathing is because God has given them life. And living here in this country at this point in history is one of the greatest blessings ever. What would your life be like if you'd been born on an Indian rubbish heap? It would be very different to, to where you are now. Do you decide where you were born? What family you're born into? These are gifts that come from God. And yet so many people in our society around here feel entitled. They feel that this belongs to them, that it's right for them to be this way, for them to have this wealth. 
And yet every penny that they've got, every degree that they have, everything which makes their life pleasant is a gift from God that they show no gratitude for whatsoever. Such people may be squeaky clean in the eyes of law in our land, but before God, they are the worst sort of sinners because they are filled with pride. These are the people who are around us. These are the people that we have been given the task of sharing the gospel with. And it's our responsibility to take the good news out and somehow through prayer and through the work of the Holy Spirit, get these people who are unclean to realize that they've got a problem so that we can get them to the point where the leper is, who knows that he's unclean, but realizes that the only way he can be cleansed is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have to be praying a lot for these people and praying for our own hearts to change as well. Well, let's move on and think about the second case. We've got the paralyzed man here. And once again, Jesus is teaching um, if you notice, he went and he prayed at the end of the uh, time of the uh, leprosy. Verse 16, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. We need to pray. We need to be praying uh, away from people. But after that, Jesus is back and now he's being examined. The boffins have arrived. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Some of them have even travelled up from Jerusalem. And the news about what he's doing has spread widely and the Pharisees have arrived. As I'm sure you know, they were an influential Jewish sect and they sought to keep the nation as close as possible to the Mosaic law. They recognized that the exile, which was an absolute national disaster, had been caused because the people had broken the law, they'd broken the Sabbath, and they'd committed idolatry. So the Pharisees were doing everything that they could to make sure that no Israelite ever did the same mistake again. They wanted every Israelite to keep the law, they wanted people to really keep the Sabbath, and they were very hot on any form of idolatry whatsoever. And the idea was that they would never go into exile again and eventually God would restore all their fortunes. That's what the Pharisees were about. They were ultra conservative. So they kept all the law, but then they thought, but there's some things in human behaviour and that can bring us really close to breaking the law. So I know, let's invent a new rule to stop people getting even close to breaking the law. And you can understand why they're doing it. They want everyone to keep the law, but what they're doing is they're guilty of adding to the law. They're coming up with all these traditions and teachings which are sitting on top of what God has requested the people to do. And this is where they started to really clash with Jesus. Because Jesus kept God's law, but he didn't keep the things that the Pharisees had added to the law. And that means that Jesus and his disciples were often clashing uh, uh, with them, especially over the Sabbath and what uh, was happening on the Sabbath. They thought that they were serving God by protecting the law, but actually they were adding to the law, and adding to God's word is a sin. So that was the Pharisees, and they had the uh, teachers of the law, who were the people who were sort of the enforcers, and they were usually uh, Pharisees as well. And for the man in the street, the Pharisees were a bit of a headache. They were a problem, because they were always telling them they can't do this, and they can't do that, and they can't do the other. But the Pharisees, were the people who had the political power. They had the connections. They knew the right people so that their opinion was respected in the circles that could enforce things. Um, so they weren't really very well liked. And these are the men that have turned up to check Jesus out. They're, they're going to be listening and watching very closely. And I'm sure none of us like to be under this kind of scrutiny at all. How often do you get something completely wrong when you're being watched? Uh, when I worked uh, as a scientist, one of the things we had to do every so often was check that the people in the, uh, I was in development, and the people in the quality control group, um, they did the tests that we developed, designed. And every so often we had to go in and check. And that included the senior scientists in the quality control group. And I remember 
you know, standing there watching the senior scientists in the quality control group with a clipboard do something she'd done 10,000 times before, and she dropped a pipette and things simply because she was being watched. We don't like being under scrutiny, do we? If you're ever being examined, Jesus knows how you feel. And that's something to, uh, you know, just reassure some of our young people through when they go through GCSEs and A-levels. Jesus knows what it's like to be under scrutiny. But of course, he doesn't make mistakes, he just gets on with business as usual. So he's teaching the people, a large crowd are gathered, no one else can get in the house, and then four men appear carrying a stretcher, and on it their good friend is paralysed. And the relationship between the four men carrying the stretcher and the man on it suggests to me that the situation here is that this man's been involved in some sort of industrial accident, broken his back, and his mates are there trying to help him. For someone in that situation, in that society, they didn't have much in the way of prospects. You know, they wouldn't need people to give them water, food, keep them clean. And back then, it wasn't very clean, it was very difficult. You know, maybe they could have lasted for a few years as a beggar, but their prospects were absolutely awful. Imagine what it would be like to face that. Dreadful, absolutely dreadful. But Jesus is in town, and this guy's mates are carrying him there. And they're determined, absolutely determined to get him to Jesus, even when a crowd won't let them through. Which I think is pretty nasty, isn't it? You know, Jesus is known as a healer, someone who has got a serious problem being brought, and the crowd won't let them through. That's not very good at all, is it? Um, so, anyway, they go up on the roof, and as we all know, they dismantle the roof, which is why I think it's probably a building accident he was involved in, because clearly they were builders, as they took the roof down without the whole thing collapsing on everyone, lowers him at Jesus' feet. Jesus is there, looking at him, and says to him, right, you're healed, up you go. That's not what he says at all, is it? He says, your sins are forgiven. Those men who had just carried him there, they wanted to see their mate walking. They didn't want to see him having his sins forgiven. But Jesus is making a point, and he's elevating this healing from being just another healing to something far more important. It's a theological point for the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees, they knew God was sovereign, they knew God was in control. And things like this only happen to bad people. That's what they believed. So this man has got a broken back or whatever he's got wrong with him because he's a great sinner. And Jesus has just said to him, son, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees' response is correct. Only God can forgive sins. So they're spot on there. The problem with the Pharisees is their lack of belief. They don't recognize who Jesus is. They're actually right in saying that only God can forgive sins. And they don't say anything. Maybe they just sit there and they're very stoic and they hide their feelings behind their beards or something like that. But anyway, Jesus demonstrates his divinity because he knows their thoughts. He knows exactly what they are thinking. And, you know, he says to them, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven, which they believe is impossible, or to get up and walk. Well, Jesus proves that so this man's sins are forgiven by saying to him, get up and walk. Because the Pharisees are thinking, he's like that because he's a sinner. So while he's a sinner, nothing can be done for him. So Jesus proves that the man is forgiven and a demonstrator of God's power, that, uh, that he is the son of God in saying, get up and walk. If you went down Tenterden High Street with a questionnaire and did a survey asking people what was more important, having your sins forgiven or being healed so you can walk again, I'm quite confident that I know which way most people would answer down there on the street. Maybe even within the church, people would answer the same way. And this is because we do not appreciate the seriousness of sin and its consequences. Sin is an offence to God. It's like sticking two fingers up at him. It denies his sovereignty and it's morally repulsive. Yet we are so blind to its evil, we just ignore it. 
and even suggests that a little bit of sin is a little bit of fun. Yet sin is more serious than cancer. Sin means that when people die, they will be separated from every blessing that God gives. They will go to a place where they are conscious, aware, and they face the terrible consequences and punishment for their sin. Because of sin, those people who die in their sins will never know joy or peace or happiness or friendship ever again. And there'll be nothing that they can do about it. When someone is a sinner, the person has no strength or ability to get themselves out of the mess that they are in. Left to themselves, there is no hope, there is only despair. Which is why having your sins forgiven is so important, it's critical, it's essential. When forgiven, everything is reversed. It means that your best days are all ahead of you. Your best days will be uh, there when you are with Jesus. You are forgiven. You can rest assured and sleep at night. You know that the God who sent his son to pay the price of your sin will never abandon you, but will always help you through the darkest situation you face. It's better to be paralyzed and forgiven than to be a world-famous Olympic athlete who is going to a lost eternity. By forgiving this man, Jesus has met the man's deepest need. He's sorted. And then, of course, he's sorted out physically as well, as Jesus demonstrates that uh, this man is forgiven by getting him to stand up. And the miracle is undeniable. The people praise God. For the Pharisees, they've just seen that God is working through Jesus. And at this point, early on in his ministry, Jesus has just proved to them that he is at least a prophet equal to Elijah or Elisha from this miracle. If that's all that they know about Jesus, plus the stories, he's already proved himself to be uh, as important as Elijah or Elisha. Of course, we know the full story. We know that he's so much more important. But we also know that the Pharisees, they didn't recognize who Jesus was. They rejected him and they went on to uh, plot um, how they were going to kill him. As believers today, do we really value the forgiveness of our sins ahead of the difficulties and problems that we face in this life? I'm sure that most of us are struggling with one thing or another at the moment. Some of us may even be at the point of despair right now as we think about what the future will bring. If you're a believer, then you can rest assured that your biggest problem is already sorted out. And no matter how dark the storm is today, you have brighter days, you have your best days ahead of you. Because we go through this life and then we go to be with Jesus. And once we're with Jesus, we're in the place where there is no more pain or sorrow, there is only peace and joy everlasting. Remember that this world is fallen, this world is broken, this world is filled with sin. And one day Jesus is coming back to sort out the problems in this world. As believers though, we know that when we come to the end of our life, or if we're alive when he arrives, we are going to a better place. And we know that he helps us in our time of difficulty, in our time of struggling, coming alongside us and giving us the strength that we need for each and every day. And we know that the Lord intervenes when we're trapped in terrible situations. I've seen it several times in my own life. I remember one time um, I had this horrible job printing football shirts and um, the guy who was running it, um, he never gave references. He always used to give very negative references. He kept us trapped there. And I remember seriously praying about it. One time going in after I'd been at Spring Harvest for a week and I said to the Lord, Lord, I can't stand this anymore. And that day was the day I was made redundant. I had one week's notice. Wonderful answer to prayer. And the Lord got me out of a bad situation. And, you know, and I'm here today because the Lord moved to get me out of that situation. The Lord does take us down difficult roads, but he uses those difficult roads to teach us things. And we can be guaranteed that it all works out for best in the end. At other times, the Lord allows us to live with difficulties. If you remember Paul and his fall in the flesh, sometimes problems come along 
to uh, keep us in the place that God wants us to be, to stop us becoming proud or stop us making mistakes. The Lord uses physical problems for our spiritual good. Then, of course, not everyone listening to this message will be a believer. Maybe someone is like a Pharisee who has to decide what Jesus is like, and they're very sure that they're right with God, but actually, really, they're filled with pride and they're in a terrible place. Or maybe you're someone like the leper or the paralysed man, and you realise that you've got terrible problems, and you're wondering if Jesus will help you. If that's you, then I encourage you, Jesus has never turned anyone away who really turns to him for help. If you go to him and admit that you're at your wit's end, that you're at the end of your tether, tether, that you have done things wrong, that you need forgiveness, that you want a fresh start, then you will be accepted and you will be helped. And your biggest problem, your sins, will be sorted out. And for anything else, the Lord will help you through or show you a way out. This love, care and compassion that Jesus shows means that for the believer, we can always have hope in the face of despair. And for all those who turn to Jesus, they will be accepted and they can discover the wonderful hope that he brings. Amen. Let's pray together briefly. Father God, we do just thank you that you are the one who sent to your son to save us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the time and the compassion that you had for people like the leper and the paralyzed man. And we thank you that today everyone who comes to you will be accepted. We do just pray that you work in people's hearts so that they recognise their problems and their needs and how you can help. And for those of us who are struggling with difficult situations or with their health problems, we do just pray that if there is a way out, that you would show it to us and lead us that way. And if not, Please Lord, just help us to struggle on each day with the problems that we face, knowing that our best days lie in the future when we will be with our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ.